Good morning, and welcome to New Covenant. My name is Chris Costaldo. I serve as lead pastor, and we are delighted to gather together as God's people and worship the King. New Covenant is dedicated to seeing Christ preached from all of Scripture, love extended to the church, the city, and the world, and lives transformed by the power of the gospel. Just a few announcements. Our NCC news for October is now available in the Narthex. You'll find new events highlighted on the front and reoccurring events on the back. We have three exciting events happening today at NCC. Uh, Our senior saints will meet in the parlor just after the service. Uh, Let's be honest, they know how to do fellowship. I hang out with the youth every Wednesday. That's, That's a lot of fun, a lot of motion, but the, the senior saints know how to party. They've, they've been at this for a while, and uh, I can't adequately express how much I enjoy the Fisher growth group in which we are together, and so um, if, that, if you are in that demographic, then please uh, join them after the service. At 3 p.m., we have Camarada Chicago performing under the direction of Droston Hall, whom I affectionately describe as the most animated Englishman I know. This will be a great concert, and it's not too late to purchase tickets at camaradachicago.org. We are collecting items in the narthex for our Sisters Together service project. Uh, Those of you who signed up to participate will find a bin located in the entranceway and another one in the office. And we're delighted to have our friend, Dr. Doug O'Donnell, opening God's word for us this morning. Luke chapter 16, and our prayer throughout this week has been for the Holy Spirit of God to use his message to penetrate our hearts. Well, toward that end, let us call ourselves to worship with the words of Psalm 43. O Lord, our God, Shine your light and truth to help us see clearly, to lead us to your holy mountain, to behold the beauty of your presence. Good morning, everyone. If you're able, please stand as we sing our hymn of adoration, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today's prayer will be drawn from Psalm 5. Please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, God of heaven and earth, hear our prayer this morning. Give attention to the sound of our cries, our King and our God. It is to you that we pray. It is to you that we offer our worship and our sacrifice this morning. Through the abundance of your steadfast love, we have entered your house. Lead us, O Lord, in your righteousness. Deliver us from our enemies and make your way straight before us. Father, we see deceit and destruction all around us, and it is all too easy to slip into despair. As a remedy, this world offers flattery and promises indulgences, but it is merely an open grave luring us in. But you, O Lord, have provided a true and righteous path. You have extended your protection over all who take refuge in you. Let us rejoice. Let us forever sing for the joy of your salvation. You have covered us with your shield. You have made a path in the wilderness. Father, we now ask for your mercy and forgiveness for the sins which we now silently confess before you. It is by your grace, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died, that we may live, that we are set free from the bondage of sin, and we thank you, Lord. Father, we lift up all who have been and continue to be affected by Hurricane Ian this week. We pray especially for help and for comfort for the families who have lost loved ones in the wake of this storm. We pray for the families of Dolly Nichols and Shirley Benchelt, who are mourning their passing this week. We give thanks to you for each of these dear women and their joyful and faithful lives. We ask that you provide comfort and peace to all of us who love them. Lord, we pray for healing, for recovery, and for comfort for all in our body who are living with health, or with financial challenges. And we pray for our brother in Christ, Doug O'Donnell, as he prepares to open your word with us this morning. Bring us a fresh revelation in this familiar parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Finally, Lord, we ask again that you hear our voices as we pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, hallowed is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's a joy for us to celebrate the Lord's table together this morning. These visible words that illustrate and compel us with the love of Christ. Our children's choir is back in session starting October 16th. That's two weeks from now. Children K through 8th grade are invited to participate. I believe an email went out this past week with all of the details. If perhaps you did not receive that, then please uh, speak with Barb Peterson, and she would be happy to give you more information. Speaking of children, there are two ways they can worship at New Covenant. One is to simply remain here among us, and the other is our Wonders of Worship program, to which children will be dismissed after the Old Testament reading. On the inside aisle of the pew, you will find our so-called friendship register. It's a place you can indicate your presence among us and any needs for which we can pray. It is our privilege to lift those needs before the throne of grace. We want to thank you for your sacrificial giving week by week, which allows the gospel to go forth from New Covenant to Naperville and uh, indeed to the ends of the earth through our missionary partners. Two ways you can give. One is the box located at the rear of the sanctuary, and the other way is online at newcovenantnaperville.org. In a moment, I'll pray for our offering along with our upcoming missions uh, festival. We're really excited to have Jonathan Zyman speaking to us this year. That is, again, in another couple of weeks. Jonathan is a friend, he's an Englishman, and uh, has served in various countries, was an evangelism pastor for many years here in DuPage County, and uh, he has a word for us. We've talked a couple of times 
about the joy that comes in witnessing for Christ. On that theme, I'll also mention you are invited to join the Missions Committee on Saturday, October 15th from 12 o'clock noon to 2 p.m. for a lunch and fellowship with our global partners, Tim and Carol Avery. It's been a while since we've seen, seen Tim and Carol, uh, and so uh, we're very excited about reconnecting. Both lunch and child care will be provided. Please RSVP, if you will, to the office by Wednesday, October 13th, indicating the number of people and ages of your children. Now, at this time, let us pray together. Lord, we do pray that in this missions festival, your spirit would work in our hearts to stimulate an earnest passion to make Jesus known to shine the light of your hope into the shadows of this world. We pray for Tim and Carol and for all of our ministry partners that they would encounter Jesus in such a personal way that their calling would be clear and they would find the strength and the inspiration that they need. And Lord, we thank you for your provision we recognize that everything we have comes from your hand, from the Father of lights in whom there is no shifting shadow. And for that, we thank you. And we pray that our sacrifice of giving to this ministry would be pleasing to you. Toward that end, we give you ourselves. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is Psalm 73. It may be found on page 485 in the Pew Bible. That is again Psalm 73. The psalmist writes, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out of their fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heathens, sorry, against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then... I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion 
forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. This passage can be found on page 876 in the Pew Bible. After the reading, please remain standing for the singing of the doxology. And now, if you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried and in Hades being in torment he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. 
And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if you do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How wonderful it is to worship through song and to listen to music played and at least if you're like me you're remembering the words of the song that was being played and meditating upon those uh, words uh, and how wonderful it is to have scripture read the perfect word of God and soon to celebrate the sacrament of Lord's Supper together and now we have the privilege of hearing from God's word so please join me in prayer. Uh, Father as Mike uh, said just a few moments ago in his prayer this is a familiar parable, but we ask that you would give us fresh revelation. That is, open our eyes to maybe see things we've never seen before. Uh, soften our hearts to care about things we, we never cared about before. And give us the will to do the things we should do. Father, may we, as Isaiah said, may we be humble, may we be contrite, may we tremble now at your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'll be honest, of all the parables, we're continuing our series in the parables, of all the parables that Jesus taught, this parable on the rich man and Lazarus was the one I was most afraid to preach on. I was afraid because it's a terrifying parable, in part, in that it talks about conscious torment after death. Now, I'm not afraid to preach clearly and faithfully what the Bible says on that topic. I'm only and honestly afraid what you might think of me, and more importantly, what you might think of God and his justice. I was also afraid to preach this parable because you and me, certainly me, me likely we, are closer socioeconomically to the rich man who eats well every day than of the poor man who has nothing. And due to that, I feared I might be tempted to downplay Jesus' stern warning on the dangers of riches. And the final reason I was afraid to preach this parable is that it raises all sorts of tough exegetical and theological questions, such as how do we make sense of this unbridgeable chasm and this unusual conversation between the rich man in Hades, or hell, or this hellish Hades, and the rich man, remember Abraham was rich, who presumably is in heaven. And when Abraham answers the rich man, remember that you in your lifetime receive good things and Lazarus in a like manner received bad things. 
but now he's comforted here and you are in anguish. Is Jesus teaching that God's judgment is merely just a reversal of fortunes? Namely, if you live well, you go to hell. If you die with sores, you receive heaven's rewards. Tough exegetical and theological questions. Now, having overcome those fears, I showed up today, I'm preaching, I'm about to preach on this parable. I still come to you with a, a bit of fear and trepidation, as, as any preacher should, always should, to God's living and active and soul-piercing, sharper than any two-edged sword word. A text that we're going to walk through, treading lightly, as I retell our Lord's short but sharp symbolic story. So get ready to be pierced. The parable is divided into two scenes, and through it our Lord will offer us, and I'll get to this at the end, four lessons. Scene one begins, if you look with me, verses 19 21, like this. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate, covered with sores, was laid a poor man named Lazarus, who desired to be fed what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now notice four details here. First, Jesus starts with the rich man's clothing. He wears purple and fine linen. I'm intentionally wearing my only purple, purplish shirt uh, this morning because it's October, the month of purple, of course, but also because this shirt is not an expensive or rare commodity. It's easy to make and get purple. But back then and there, it took a specialist to get what he or she needed and then to take those various materials, these dyes, and put them all together and create this rare color. It also wasn't easy to get where Jesus lived in and around Jerusalem, Galilee. It had to be imported from Tyre, which is far north of, of that region, or the coast of Cyprus or even uh, Cyprus or even Rome. In Revelation 18, uh, 12, Rome is described as shipping precious cargo around the world, and it includes gold, silver, bronze, iron, marble, jewels, pearls, silk, Fine linen, more on that, than a mat, that in a minute. Fine linen and purple, purple cloth. So all that to say, if you have a purple robe back then and there, it would immediately communicate to people that you have money and you want people to know you have money. It would be like a man in the 1980s stepping out of a red Ferrari Testarossa wearing a mink coat with a large gold chain around his neck. We may have, may not looked like that back in the days. <laughs> now this proud man, in a more serious note, he is wearing the mark of pride, his purple robe. And also Jesus tells us he is sporting the most expensive imported Egyptian underwear, also called fine linen. What commentator David Garland labels the most delicate and most expensive fabric known to the ancient world. So from top to tail, this man is well dressed. Second, Jesus moves from this man's clothing to his self-indulgent and excessive eating, his eating. In the Lord's Prayer, our Lord teaches us, as we just prayed, to pray for our daily Bread. The average person in Jesus' bread, a day would, would have daily bread and perhaps some fruit, vegetables, fish. And from time to time at a family wedding or Passover or other special religious occasions, some lamb, some meat, and other delicacies. The rich man here in Jesus' parable feasted sumptuously. I'll, I'll explain that word in just a second in the next sentence every day, that is every single day of his life, his meals were expensive, opulent, and impressive. And third, from Jesus' first two descriptions of the rich man, he turns then in striking 
con contrast to Lazarus. And at his gate, the rich man's gate, he had a gate, was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even, or, or but, it's a, an adversative in Greek, but as Lazarus is thinking about eating, wishing to eat, the dogs came and ate, licked his sores. So the rich man, he's clothed in purple and fine linen, and the poor man is covered with sores that you can see, which means he's naked. And these contrasts, the rich, poor, the, the clothed, the covered with sores are not the only contrasts. The rich man is pictured as reclining at table inside a house that is surrounded by a fence that has a gate, and the poor man is lying outside that gate and longing He's longing not for the delicacies, not for some barbecue fattened calf or a sip of his Bordeaux, but he wants just scraps that fall from the rich man's table, a few crumbs, I'm sure, that also fell off his protruding gut down to the floor. And instead, here's another contrast, the only creature outside the gate who gets to eat or lick anything are these ugly and unclean scavenger dogs that roam around the town scraping for any substance that can keep them alive or momentarily satiated, satisfied. And the final contrast is that of health and safety versus sickness and vulnerability. The rich man is obviously well fed and he's secure. He's got a gated community. He's part of a gated community, his own community. While the poor man is starving and he's completely vulnerable, he's helpless. He has some disease that has caused these infectious sores all over his body, it made him so weak that he had to be laid at the gate of the only person in town who at this point could help him. The richest man in town, someone who would have the food, the, the needed nourishment, someone who would have a staff of servants who could help him with basic needs, likely had medical supplies, had the finances to pay for the best doctors in the region. Ah, but the only hints of hope that Lazarus has are not in the richest man in town, but in God, in the God of Lazarus. And what do I mean? I mean this. It is highly unusual for Jesus to name people in his parables. In fact, this is the only time anyone has ever named in his parables. Why here? Well, the name Lazarus instructs us that this poor man is part of God's chosen people, the promised people. He, he's a Jew. His name is Lazarus. In Hebrew, his name means the one who God helps. <laughs> really, you might say. Helps. When? Precisely. Stay tuned for the end of the story. He will soon and forever receive his eternal reward. Something I believe, based on how the parable plays out, that Lazarus himself actually believed. If it's not stated, I know it's not stated, but it's strongly implied, this aspect of his faith, in two different ways. First, the closest person in the Bible who is described like Lazarus is described here is Job. Job, the poster boy, poster man, of faith of faith through unbearable, inexplicable affliction. When Satan demanded that God let him test Job's faith, faith by letting him inflict his skin, skin for skin, let me touch his flesh, is what Satan asked for. What did Satan do once God allowed it? Satan struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And the sickness, you might remember, was so severe, his friends, when they came upon him, they didn't, they didn't even recognize him. And his wife was so distraught over his condition that she counseled him to end his life, curse God and die, advice that Job did not heed. Instead, he responded how? He responded, responded in faith. Shall we not receive good from God and not also trouble? Lazarus is like Job, both in his specific affliction, but also as it plays out in his faith. And second, I say that secondly, because he's like Abraham, who Paul calls, Romans 
uh, 4.11, the father of all who believe. So if Abraham is your true father, then you believe. I suggest strongly that this Lazarus, who ends up in the presence of Abraham, feasting with the father of faith for eternity, believes in God's promises just like Abraham did. He took God at his word. He believed, I believe, that what Jesus taught in the immediate context in Luke 16, 17, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law of the Old Testament to become void. He believed, for example, then, if he believed in his Bible, he believed the poor should be cared for. His Bible clearly taught, and, and something I'll, I'll explain in further detail before you run out the door, that someone in his condition should be provided for by God, God's people, and those whom God has given the resources to do so. I honestly think that he thought that this rich man, as a Jew, a fellow Jew like him, his last hope, that he would, according to the law, he would help him. Just like the men who must have carried him to the gate were trying to help him. Uh, but once he laid there long enough, he knew that this rich man, this rich man was not a good man. What then did he do? Well, he did what all starving human beings would do. He longed for something to eat, something, anything, crumbs, scraps. But I think he also turned in faith to what he knew was in God's word. Perhaps what he's heard over and over in synagogue, where he went as a boy, a teenager, until he became sick, however old he was. Perhaps he, he prayed outside the gate there in his suffering at the end of Psalm 73, which was just read, where after the psalmist contemplates the judgment that will come upon the godless rich, he declares, nevertheless, I'm continually with you, God. You hold my right hand. What a beautiful image. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards, after this life, you promised you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth I desire but you. My flesh and my heart, my body inside and out may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, and notice the turn here, listen up, those who are far from you, like this rich man, shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. You have been near God in affliction? Near God. I have made the Lord Yahweh, the Lord God, my refuge. His only refuge. Now as the curtain closes on scene one... Scene two opens with the closing scenes of two very different lives and the ongoing story of two very different afterlives. Starting in verse 22 and ending in verse 24, we read, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes. He saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he, he yelled, he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water to cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. Scene one begins, there was a rich man. Scene two, the poor man. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Reads like a good English poem. It looks, it reads like a good English or Greek line announcing a good thing. The moment that Lazarus dies, God opens up the skies and brings help. Angels descend from the sky and raise him up. I'll fly away, O oh Lord, I'll fly away to the heavens to recline at table with Abraham. Abraham, the righteous rich man of the Old Testament. The goat of the OT. The CEO of the VIPs. Abraham. Now in contrast with that happy picture, 
The Lord presents another. The rich man also died, and, and fill in the blank. How would it have gone in his day and age? Well, similar to ours. He would have had quite the funeral. <laughs> quite the funeral. All the important people were there. The more important people eulogized. He was a fine man, a good man, a, an industry giant, a pillar of our community. The procession to the burial site, it wouldn't be like the Queen's, but it would be quite the sight. All of that or something like that happened, but that's not how Jesus tells the story. That's not how his sentence ends. The rich man also died and was buried. Lazarus goes up to heaven, the rich man down in the dirt. How unspectacular. How human. What is also as human as the judgment he's experiencing. Look down at verses 23 and 24. And in Hades, now this is a term that's used throughout the Bible, but in the New Testament it's really interesting. It's only used of a place where unbelievers go. That's why I said earlier, a hellish Hades. So in Hades, in this place of the dead, he saw Abraham far off, Lazarus by his side. Notice the repetition of side. That's where Lazarus is. He's by his side, Abraham's side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, a, a real body part. It's a real person. For I am in anguish in this flame. Imagine that. Imagine that. Imagine being a sinner in the hands of an angry God, a rightfully wrathful toward the wicked God, a holy, holy, holy God. Well, this imaginary story about the unimaginable but true continues. But Abraham, his so-called father, said child or son, an ironic twist, remember that in your lifetime you received good things. And Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. Well, now he's comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between you and us, there's a great chasm that's been fixed. So, so Jesus doesn't, doesn't view that there's a second chance. He doesn't view that eventually everyone will get to heaven. There's a huge chasm. In order that those who would pass from here to you are not able, and none may cross from there to here, from hell to heaven. One of the questions I often ask as I'm preparing for a sermon is I, I, I look at the text and I say, what's surprising? Well, it's not surprising to me that there's this large, unbridgeable gap between heaven and hell. I would imagine that would be the case. I'm also not surprised that there's no second chances. Uh, what I am surprised is that it is depicted here in this fictional story. It's not intended to be a, a doctrinal treatise on the afterlife, but a visual warning, this fictional story, that the great chasm is not so far, this is what's surprising, that a man in hell and a man in heaven can hold a conversation. And what is surprising about the conversation is that, A, it reveals that this rich man not only knew the, of the poor man's existence, he actually knew his name. He knew his name, which makes him completely culpable. He can't, and he doesn't say to Abraham, I never saw him. I, I, never, I never saw the poor man. Oh, and if I would have saw him, well, I, I would have helped him. He doesn't say that. No, he saw Lazarus, who he knew. We don't know how he knew him. Did his guards tell him? Did he grow up with him in synagogue? How he knew him, but Lazarus, each and every time he opened his big and fancy gate, he knew Lazarus was there. So what's surprising about this conversation, it reveals that he knew the poor man was there, that he existed, he even knew his name. And B, that the rich man, even after Abraham tells him why in part he is in hell, he offers no apology. He offers no apology to Lazarus. I've known at least two narcissists in my life. You know what a narcissist cannot do? Apologize. The inability to say, I am sorry, is a damnable inability. And instead of offering an apology to Lazarus, 
He third is to see, he ignores him altogether and he talks around him to Abraham. He uses the, the race and covenant card. He uses also the, well, one rich guy to another, wink. Abraham, do something for me, I'll do something for you. And indeed, the fourth surprise, he orders, he orders Abraham. No one orders Abraham but God. He orders Abraham to order Lazarus to serve him. This rich man ignored day after day Lazarus' plea for food and for water. And now he expects Lazarus to get up in the middle of his fellowship feast with Abraham to leap over some dark and dangerous chasm in order, order to alleviate his thirst, the gall. Abraham's answer, perhaps another surprise, is no. No. After death, there will be no mercy for the merciless. Learn that lesson. After death, there will be no mercy for the merciless. Conversely, as our Lord taught in the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, the story is almost over, but the surprises continue. We come to scene two, act two, to the second and third of three cycles. You might have noticed that the rich man speaks, Abraham answers, the rich man speaks, Abraham answers, the rich man speaks, and Abraham answers. Verse 27 through 31, and the rich man said, I beg you, he, he's become the beggar now, father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five Brothers. Now, perhaps he's trying to show that he cares about others. Now, now he cares about others in need. Or, or he's still looking out for the interest, his own interests, the interests of his family, which is just an extension of him. He cares about his brothers, his rich brothers, who live just like him. But he doesn't care about the least of the brothers, as Jesus teaches, the poor, in the parable of the sheep and the goats. I beg you to send Lazarus to my five brothers so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, which tells us they're a religious family. They have a Bible. Let them hear them. And he said, no, no, Father Abraham, no. Throughout his life, he has dismissed what the Bible taught, and now he dismisses one final time its authority and its sufficiency. But if someone goes to them from the dead, how about this idea? Not the Bible idea. Give me a supernatural sign. Then they will repent, Abraham said to him. If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Well, what's said in the law and the prophets, what we would call our Old Testament? What, what's the wisdom and the warnings that, that he would have heard if he went to church, to synagogue? He and his brothers, if they sat together there, what would they have heard? Well, they would have heard Isaiah 58, where God tells Israel the worship he wants is to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house. And when you see the naked, to cover him and to pour yourself out, pour yourself out on the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted. Or Deuteronomy 15. If anyone among you, one of your brothers, not a blood brother, but an Israelite, should become poor, these things happen. If any of your towns, uh, someone becomes poor, and any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, he's given you everything, you shall not harden your heart like this rich man or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and, and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it might be. You shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and the poor in your land. That's the Old Testament. Of course, we as Christians, we have a more expansive testimony 
than Moses and the prophets. We have, we have the Gospels, we have the Epistles, we have the Apocalypse, where we read, for example, James's instruction to treat the poor well because God has chosen those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to all those who love him, rich and poor. And how ministry to those in need is viewed by the apostles as part and parcel of faithful gospel ministry. In Galatians 2, Peter and Peter is talking about his, Paul's talking about his relationship with Peter, how they're both going out to do gospel ministry. Peter's going to take the gospel to the Jews. Paul's going to take it to the Gentiles. And Peter and James ask Paul and Barnabas, while they're doing gospel ministry, to remember the poor. Remember the poor, the very thing Paul says he was eager to do. Are we eager to do? Moreover, we have recorded in the Gospels the incarnation. Remember that? What did Jesus, the God-man, do on earth? Who did he talk to? Who did he heal? Who did he love? He loved the loveless. He helped the helpless. Go and do likewise. Now that's one of the lessons. Might be the major lesson we learn throughout this parable, but I have three more. First, as it relates to the context, this is really interesting. When, when Jesus taught, so this is verse 13, after Jesus taught the parable of the dishonest, dishonest manager, which ends, you cannot serve God and money, so as it relates to the context and to, to those who were listening to that particular parable, verse 14, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard these things. So related to the context, it is quite clear here that Jesus is teaching this lesson. The love of money is an eternally damnable disease. The love of money, not having money, the love of money is an eternally damnable disease. The American dream. I'm all for the American dream. My father grew up in the poorest land in, in Ireland, the West uh, Connemara. He, he lived the American dream. He, he, he grew up, he worked hard, he came to America in his 20s, became an engineer, and he made money enough to raise five kids, nothing extravagant. He lived the American dream, but the American dream, as it's so often talked about today, is a bad dream. It's a bad dream. It's not about what my dad did. It's about having money, and if you have money, then you've lived the American dream. Well, that's a bad dream that we need to wake up from. And once you've awakened up from that dream, be rich towards God. Remember last time I was here, Luke 12? Be rich towards God. How does Jesus teach us the end of the parable of the rich fool? And after that, in the context, we are rich towards God by, back to lesson one, providing for those who are in need. Second, understand and accept and embrace the sufficiency of Scripture. Understand, accept, and embrace the sufficiency of Scripture. At the climax, the end stress, within the end stress of the parable, that is the clear lesson. Understand, accept, embrace the sufficiency of Scripture. The rich man asks Abraham to send a saint in heaven to warn his brothers on earth about the anguish of hell. And Abraham tells him they just need to pay attention in church when the Bible's read and explained. <laughs> the rich man says, well, I know my brothers. <laughs> They'd rather be watching the Bears game. I know my brothers. I also know the Bible isn't so spectacular. And these guys, they need something more spectacular. And how does Abraham respond? He said, if they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now listen, Abraham's not exaggerating here. Or Jesus through Abraham, the voice, He's recalling, he's predicting historical truth. Remember Herod, back to Herod, King Herod, bad Herod. Who does Herod think Jesus is? He thinks it's John the Baptist. 
who, who he, he beheaded. He's having a guilt trip. He thinks John the Baptist, who he beheaded, back from the dead. Okay, then. That's who you think Jesus is? Does that change him? Does that deter him from his evil ways? No. Does that make him want to follow, trust in Jesus? No. Another example, remember the response to when Jesus raised Lazarus, uh, same name, it was a popular name back then, different man, top five boy's name. I don't know why people don't. Lazarus is a good name, think about it. Remember the response when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. John 11 records this. Many were told believed in Jesus. Right response. And some went. They told the Pharisees. I think they were excited. They told him what Jesus had done. He raised this guy from the dead. And the Pharisees and the chief priests, they got together. They held a religious council. And there was some good debate over the matter, I'm sure. That scene ends with this ominous line. So from that day on, they made plans to put Jesus to death. What? Remember finally the reaction to Jesus' own resurrection. Listen to the scene right after the, the greatest miracle in history. After the guards stationed at the tomb witnessed the stone roll away and, and presumably some dead man get up and get out, some of them went and they told the chief priest that this had taken place. Good idea. Uh, tell the highest religious authorities in the land. Those religious authorities, they quickly got together with other religious authorities. And when these religious men gathered around to talk about the matter, they decided they'd hike up their robes and go find out for themselves. No. It's not what happened. Matthew gives us the minutes from the meeting. The first council of the big lie about the resurrection. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, this is what they decided. They, they, they gave a sufficient amount of money to the soldiers to shut up. Tell the people. His disciples came by at night and stole him away while they were asleep. And if this gets, if that story gets to the governor's ears, we'll satisfy him. We'll take care of him. We'll keep you out of trouble. So what happens? They took the money. And they did as they were directed. The Roman guards knew about Jesus' resurrection. The Jewish religious leaders knew about Jesus' re resurrection. But both groups did not repent. I love Charles Dickens, but Jesus actually teaches here the opposite of what's taught in the Christmas carol. It's only because Scrooge sees and hears from the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future that he repents. Jesus teaches that those who worship money like Scrooge did, they will not be persuaded by dead people coming back to them with a message or two or three. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me, but it's not the book for them. No ghost. No angel, no resurrected human being will turn their heart around. Listen, the rich man's brothers and billions of people around the world, anyone these days with internet access or a Bible in hand, they have Moses and the prophets. And if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, if they will not listen to the Bible, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead, the sufficiency of scripture. Third and finally, in heaven, we are saved not just from sin and suffering, whatever form it is taking in your life or has taken, we're not only saved from sin and suffering and death, but we're saved from the wrath of God. We're saved from the wrath of God. Yes, Lazarus not only saved from a terrible earthly life, but, but a horrid eternal judgment. And this is not just his story of salvation. It's the story of everyone who is saved. All true believers were saved from something. 
we're saved from the wrath of God. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, and 10, Paul gives this very clear and concise definition of the gospel and response to the gospel when he writes about how that church repented. They turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God and that they believed in Jesus whom God raised from the dead and who upon his return will deliver them and deliver us from the wrath to come. Noah and the flood, the Passover, the parting and the closing of the Red Sea. Do you believe that we're saved not just from sin and suffering and death, but we're saved ultimately from the wrath of God? You see, Jesus teaches that lesson, something that preachers are afraid to preach. He teaches that lesson in this short, sharp as a two-edged story teaches. And let us, let God's word cut us to the heart. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that through your spirit you did what we asked, that you have taken this old and familiar parable and you have given it new life in our minds and our hearts and our wills. Lord, help us to believe what is taught in your word. Help us to live out that. And Lord, help us to be thankful that whatever we are going through, whatever suffering or affliction that is, is anything like Job or Lazarus, that there is an end game, that you will take us, whisk us away into heaven where there will be perfect peace and love and fellowship and feasting. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Doug. I'm not wearing purple, but I am sufficiently convicted, we who are so blessed of God, and that is the, the spirit in which we approach the table, as Jesus himself said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's nothing spectacular. It's not a fantastic experience. It's a simple message of Christ crucified and risen from the dead. And that is the story that this table tells. And so with that promise before us, let us pray together. Almighty God, unto whom our hearts are open, our desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts now by your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify you. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Well, that's the meaning of this table. It signifies communion. Men and women who were separated from God, lost in sin, have been drawn near and if you're here today and that is your faith, then you're welcome to partake of the elements which we'll distribute in just a moment. If you're here this morning, perhaps, and you have never come to the place of bowing the knee before King Jesus, confessing your sins, well, then we ask you to allow the elements to pass by and take the heart to heart the message we have heard this morning. Hope will not come by an angel or by... Uh, some fantastic experience that blows your mind. No, it comes from a message of good news of what God did for us so many years ago on a hill outside of Jerusalem when his son died for our sins, taking our guilt upon himself and was then raised from the dead. Well, Paul describes that victory in 1 Corinthians 11 when he says, For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it 
and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Love so amazing, so divine, I was struck as Doug uh, spoke the words, uh, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. God has shown us his mercy. Jesus said, this is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray for the cup. Every time, Lord, we partake of the cup, we present ourselves afresh to give you our heart, our thoughts, all that we are. Because of Jesus, our crucified and risen Savior, we do that now by faith.
two ways the message from this morning is working on me that I'm aware of now. One is conviction. Is my heart tender to those who are in need, to the poor? Am I giving sacrificially? And the other is boldness in witness and gospel proclamation because it is indeed through our feeble attempts to tell others the good news of Jesus that the Holy Spirit imparts life, indeed life eternal. In view of that truth, Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, at this time, I invite you to please stand as we sing together our hymn of response. benediction, I selected 2 Timothy 4.18, which is a summary, a wonderful summary in the first line of, of what we're to do and what God has done for us, excuse me, but, and then it's also a doxology, so you're getting a benediction and a doxology all in one. I received that. The Lord will rescue us from every evil deed and bring us safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 